Hello and welcome to the Life Magnetics Podcast or to my YouTube channel. Just I don't know where you're consuming this content, but wherever you are, I certainly hope that you're having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. And I'm coming at you with another really wonderful conscious conversation that I recently had with one Corby Mitleid. Now, Corby is a certified tarot reader and an all around interesting and fun person. She's she's very quirky, but she's got like this wealth of knowledge in all things paranormal and all things spiritual, metaphysical, and this includes uh, topics like reincarnation, past lives. This includes Ouija boards and spirits and ghosts. This also extends to psychic protection. She talks a little bit about being attacked in the world of spirit and how she handled that. We get into tarot, we get into psychics, how you can find a psychic with integrity. Like We really talk about all of the paranormal and psychic things. And I know so many of you listening and watching Truly, truly appreciate that. I know that's probably how you found me in the first place all those years ago. So also, I want to say, make sure you listen to kind of the end of the podcast, because anytime we have an intuitive that comes on the pod or on the channel, I always ask them, hey, what do you see for 2023? Or what do you see for the next year or two? And I asked Corby, and she gave me an answer, and you're going to want to listen to it. Now, the links uh, to reach out to Corby are definitely in the description of this podcast or this video, so check it out. And I also want to tell you to make sure that you're connected to me as well, um, and you can do that by going to my text community, textcac.com. That's textcac.com. Now, this community is the community that I reach out to first. Anytime I'm doing something in my work or in my life, these are the folks who hear about it. It's completely free if you're in the States. And I think it could be free. Even if you're not, you're going to have to check for yourself. But definitely become a part of my text community. And also, you're always going to want to check out my website, crystallancompton.com crystallinecompton.com. I've presently got in a Course in Miracles study group that I'm involved in. I also am going to have a workshop on ancestral or epigenetic healing and cutting cords and the Ho'oponopono. Like that's going to be coming up in the next few months. And I'm just, I'm, spirits moving is all I'm saying. And if you want to be a part of that, definitely my text community and definitely my website. All right. Now that that's out of the way and without further ado, let's get into today's absolutely fascinating conversation with Corby Mitleid. Corby Mitleid has been reading since 1973. She's traveled coast to coast and into Canada as a full-time intuitive counselor and is an inspirational speaker and facilitator. Corby is a certified tarot master and a certified professional tarot reader, a member of the American Tarot Association and the Tarot Guild, and an ordained minister of the Sanctuary of the Beloved, which is the Order of Melchizedek, which I'm so, I want to ask questions about. <laughs> she is a trained medium and past life specialist. She's featured, she is a featured channel in Robert Schwartz's breakthrough series, Your Soul's Plan, Your Soul's Gift, and Your Soul's Love, and is herself the author of Clean Out Your Life Closet, The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, and You've Got the Magic, Who Needs a Genie? Welcome to the podcast, Corby. I love those titles. Those are awesome. Thanks, Crystal. It's great to be here. I'm so, I'm excited to have you. Um, you probably can't see, but like right over there is just the beginning of all of my tarot cards, oracle cards, and all of that. I've just got a whole cubby. Yeah. And then and then I, I do love I do love a card. Be, before we get into what it is that you do, I always like to ask about how you got here. I myself was a very psychic child, had a lot of different kinds of experiences. And so were you a psychic child? What kind of a spiritual path did you take early on? Well, um, no and yes. Anecdotally, they say that those of us who have the gift and we're really active in it, got a clap on the head when we were kids. Well, when I was four, sliding down Kramer Hill, nobody had taught me how to roll off my sled and I went face first into a concrete bench. Boom! Oh no. Didn't even fracture the skull, but where did it hit? Third eye. So maybe that had something to do with it. Oh. When I was nine, I read a book called The Witch Family by Eleanor Estes and thought, oh, there's magic in the world. I want to go find it. 
fast forward to 1973 when I was a senior in high school. I was working part-time at Spencer Gifts. They had the James Bond 007 tarot deck and I bought it because we were all hippies then. You had your elephant bell bottoms and your fringe jacket and your deck. Five years later, everyone else had moved on to roller skates and disco balls, but I was still reading the cards because they fascinated me. So for 20 years, I read for friends. Then all of a sudden in the early 90s, I could do hands-on healing and talk to dead people with no training. That's when the universe handed me my draft notice and said, hello, you're working for us. Part-time for 20 years. Uh, the day of 9-11, I looked at my husband. I said, I need to do this full-time. People need to know there are other answers out there. He said, I believe in you. Go do it. It's been 20 years. I work six days a week. I read a thousand people a year and I get to get up in the morning. I don't have to get up in the morning. That's the biggest gift. I love that. Wow. A thousand people a year. It's not if you're we 365 days a that's year. A lot. That's mm -hmm. about four or five people a day. Mm -hmm. That's not a lot. That's <laughs> I'm, oh my gosh. Um, I did have a question about tarot before we get into everything that you do. And I, I do read tarot. I've always had the cards that had the actual explanations of each card on the card. Um, but for me, tarot is really powerful when I just kind of connect with the images or the colors and get a sense of what the card is trying to tell me. And I have to say, like, I can pull the same card for two different people, but it doesn't always mean the same thing. It feels more like a gateway is what I'm trying to say. Can you relate to that? And what do you have to say? 2000%. to thousand percent. Yeah. Two thousand percent. One of the reasons that I am a certified tarot master is because I understand the allegory in a card. For instance, let's look at the Six of Swords. Mm -hmm. When you look at that card, the way I explain it, in order to go from the rough waters to the smooth, the woman in the boat mourns because she had to leave a lot of what told her who she was on the dock or her boat wouldn't float. So that's the allegory. And it can be what happens when you're divorced or widowed, when you're looking at changing your career, uh, when you're giving up parts of yourself that you don't like anymore. So it has a basic meaning, like a tree trunk, but how you go off it mm. is based on your intuition and is based on what the client needs to know. Now, uh, another thing that I tell people, especially rookies, there are three cards that weird them out death the devil and the tower right and i explain no it's not that <laughs> relax and the tower card looks very doom gloom and destruction you know fire and people falling off and i say i want you to think of it this way it's the imploding sports stadium yankees want to build a new stadium they got to blow up the first the old one first and clear the ground that takes people at a totally different place. They are willing to listen and they can see how it works in their life. Now, sometimes we just get meanings that are so off on planet Zorch, we don't know. And the card example I use for that is the Three of Pentacles. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the Tarot Illuminati deck by Eric Dunn. It's my favorite. And he has different cultures for the suits. So this is Asian. But in the standard rider weight, We've got a stained glass window in a church and a stone mason working on the wall. It usually means mastery. But there was a couple that I was reading for in Kitchener, Ontario, and I looked at the card and what came out of my mouth was, there's an abandoned or deconsecrated church within a couple of miles from here and you're supposed to open up a cafe bakery. Meanwhile, I'm thinking they think that I'm on drugs, but they look <laughs> at each other and they now they go, oh yeah, we know we've been arguing about that one for two years. That's when it's spirit saying, they need a clap on the head. Tell them this. So interesting. So you just showed us one of your favorite decks. You, uh, you said it was the Tarot Illuminati? By Eric Dunn. Yes. By Eric Dunn. It is Rider Waite based, mm -hmm. but the artwork yeah. is so glorious. It looks more that... saturated from what I can see here, just the colors yes. and things of that nature. Yeah. Very much. Very much. So if someone's just starting out and interested in getting into Tarot, how do you choose a deck i mean for example crystals i've got a lot of crystals and 
my personal philosophy is I want to touch the crystal. I want to be the crazy lady in the back talking to the crystal. Like I want to get a sense of how we're going to work together or how we're going to complement each other. Is that does the same rule kind of apply to decks? Your deck's going to be your buddy. Mm -hmm. Your deck is the one that you always reach for every day. Now, mind you, I use one tarot deck and seven oracle decks plus a children's deck that I bring to shows in case little two-year-old muffin is sitting on the lap and goes mommy mommy card um so do you like collage do you like photographs do you like artwork do you like edgy goth do you like the rich almost art deco art nouveau do you want to be so standard typical 1920s rider weight so you get it right that's how you have to look at it when you look at a dress you're going to wear when you look at curtains for your house, when you look at um, a china pattern that you're going to be eating off of every day, you don't say, I have to have X. You go in, you look, you're drawn to some, you hold them up and you go, which one? That is how you're going to read with your cards. There have been decks that have looked wonderful to me and I've gotten them on Amazon and they come home and it's like, no. Right. I go to somebody else and that's okay. The decks are not gonna go, she didn't like me. <laughs> the decks, my darlings, are ink on paper. Right. They are nothing to be afraid of. They're nothing to think. They have feelings. You put your energy in it and they react based on the upstairs energy that feeds through them. But the cards themselves are not alive. There is also this idea that your first deck should be gifted to you. Have you heard? I, my niece came over for Thanksgiving and she looked at all my decks and she's like, I want to have my first deck but i think somebody's supposed to give it to me and i'm like well let's have a look and i ended up gifting her a deck but is that the case no okay and you don't have to keep them wrapped in silk i mean i am sitting here and my decks uh, since i've got a green screen behind me i'm not sure how sure well there's but you see this guys yeah it's in a staples rack card thing and they're all <laughs> lined up and it's how i use them because i use them every day there are no real traditions with decks, except that I find I work best with them. And this is just me. When I get a deck the first time I go through, I look at every card. I do sit with the deck. I ask the energies that will work through the deck to come on down. Very glad you're here. And I will pull one card and say, who wants to work with me first? Who wants to bring me into the mastery of the deck? And there'll be a card. But that's because I am fanciful that way. <laughs> I mean, you know, I can anthropomorphize as a fire hydrant if I need to, but it doesn't mean that because a tarot master does it this way, you have to. Please trust yourself. Please, if you get the message from your guides that you're supposed to stand at the top of your stairs and play 52 pickup with the deck and the one that hits the bottom of the stairs first is your card, then do it, <laughs> just do it. I love that. What about clearing your deck when you get one? Should you like clear it with sage? Do you do anything like that? A little ritual or no? Just no. how you feel. Just how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So you are such an active, intuitive and psychic medium, um, about a thousand people a year. You know, I've been to many psychics. I used to be a professional reader myself for a couple of decades. And there's just kind of a difference <laughs> between psychics. There are the psychics mm -hmm. who can be very accurate, but they don't feel necessarily like they have a great intention or like um, their vibration is just a little off. There's the psychic with the neon palm in the, in the window in the strip mall and you go in and she's got all these thing, curses that she wants to remove from you. And then there's psychics who have real gifts and talents and who are in integrity. How can somebody who wants to visit a psychic know the difference? How can they choose a psychic? Do you have any advice for us? I have a time. Number one, that's what this book is about, The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, How yes. to Find the Real Wizards and Avoid the Flying Monkeys. My idea is good psychic guidance is art, don't settle for a forgery. And that book does not tell you how to be a psychic. There are millions of those. It tells you how to choose a psychic, what to look for, what questions to ask, when to run, how to stay safe. And I'll be honest, I don't care if you never come to me after you've read that book. If you take from it what it takes to find a good intuitive, well, all boats rise. It's not a matter of, you know, my aura don't stink, so you can only go to me. Now, 
let's say you're first going to a psychic fair, an expo, and you don't know any of us from Adam's house cat. Well, I tell people you have to be a good puppy. First thing is you go in and you do your walkies. <laughs> you go around and you look at everybody. You don't have to talk, but just get a feel for what you see. Some of us, well, we'll have a booth full of crystals. Some of us like me will have booths with information. Some people will have the palm sign. Then like a good puppy, you have to get paper trained. And that's where you go to all of us and you pick up rack cards or business cards that have our information. This is my rack card. So you would find this. It tells you a little about what I do, has some information on the back from clients. Then if we're not busy, go talk to the three or four that feel good to you. If we are busy, talk to our front people. They're the people who man the booth for us so we can read. But remember, I can tell you I'm wonderful and that doesn't count. And we hire our front people to say they love us. My first front person was the wonderful Laura Spickerman. Laura was my husband's office manager at his museum Monday through Friday. Think she's going to dismiss his museum director on the weekends? Probably not. You want to go and find our testimonial books. We all have them on the table. If you're looking at us online, we'll have them on our websites. Are we good? Are we funny? Are we accurate? Do we have specialties, children, dogs, dead people? Do people come back? But the last and most important thing is check in at your heart chakra, mm -hmm. truly. If the psychic doesn't feel like they have a brain in their head, they really care about what they're doing, or they're going to give you good information, don't go there no matter how cool the wiki woo stuff looks on the table. Yes. I'm serious. And it's also bedside manner. You know, I joke about glurpy purple with angels, which is not me. Those are the intuitives they're usually the younger ones who go, hi, I'm Little Dancing Raccoon, and here's my spirit guide, Arctic Bear. Let's see what your angels are going to say. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a New Yorker. That drives me crazy. <laughs> um, but when I read in Canada, I shared a booth with my wonderful friend, Debbie Dyer. Now, Debbie is a silver-haired grandmother type, and she tells you what you need to know, but she is the iron fist in the velvet glove. Me? I'm from New York. I'm very <laughs> practical. I will hit you upside the head with a clue brick and say, here are your opportunities and how to grab them. Here's the tough stuff. Here's how to get through it or around it. Here's your toolbox to rock and roll. Both of us are masters at what we do, but you will feel the click with one or the other of us. And each of us understands that's perfectly fine. Just like some people want a doctor who's warm and compassionate, and some just want the brilliant technical surgeon who says do this, but they're both good doctors. Make sense? Yes, it does make sense. I remember <clears throat> when I was kind of just exploring spirituality and my psychic abilities were turning on, I just, I was driving down this road and I saw one of those palm signs and I'm like, let me just stop and go in and see what's going on in there. I went in and there was a lady in there and she invited me in. And as soon as I entered it seemed like it was her house. I just had this feeling in my chest and in my gut, just this icky, icky, icky feeling. She ushered me over to a table and she immediately started calling out the curses that I had attached to me and her solutions for this, which cost, you know, hundreds of dollars and you've got to come back next week too and stuff like that. And so this? I guess, right. Oh. Is, is that like one of the first, I mean, obviously I was like my scam alert, my little um, bell is going off, but it, I also, I'm, I'm just attesting to what you're saying. I felt it. I could feel it yes. immediately like, ooh, yes. this is not right. But is that right. kind of one of the, the common things that scam psychics do, like the curses and the money? Yes, yes. I refer to them as the Madam Hoo-Has and the Swami Swalandas. And <laughs> one of those is the reason that I wrote Psychic Elbert Road. This was 20 years ago. I was doing a massive psychic expo in Canada, 250 booths. And as good as the promoters were, they can't vouch for everybody. So across the way, there was one of the fake gypsies. What's a fake gypsy? They wear the long skirt and the jingling jewelry and the headscarf. They do bad accent and you too can be gypsy, yeah? So a woman was walking down the road and the fake gypsy comes out from behind her booth and grabs her by the arm. Now, this is called hooking and it's mm -hmm. as bad as the other kind of hooking. And she okay. goes, oh, you no need to pay 30, 40, 50 dollars. I'll use your palm for 10. Come, drags the woman into the booth behind the screen. 
20 minutes later, we see the client leave crying hysterically and a bunch of us run over what happened. And sure enough, she had said, oh, you have a family curse. How many in your family? Four, you have dog? $50 every family member, 24 foot dog. He's six, he, he, we fix. And she said, if the client didn't burn 400 specially blessed candles at the Roman Catholic Church, I bless real good, only $1 candle. Her entire family was gonna die in a car accident in two weeks and she bought it. Oh, man. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Smoke coming out of my ears. And that's why this book is so important to right. help you avoid that kind of stupidity. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't even go to psychics because they think that maybe that's mm -hmm. what it is. They don't even really understand that there are a lot of really great intuitives out there offering mm -hmm. some fantastic services. You mentioned um, when you were telling us about your, your childhood that you found a book. What was it called again? The Witch Family by Eleanor S. This is just a little children's book. I, I love that. Um, I remember as a child feeling very connected to, I, I would watch Bewitched and I'm like, oh, something about that. It's very interesting yep. to me. I'd go to the library, I'd go into the, the special little new age section and I'd look at all kind of the witchy books. I remember being, I had to have been maybe nine out on these big stone steps in Hawaii, summoning what I now know are like the elements, calling them mm -hmm. forth. And to me, that's because I must have had some kind of a past life impulse. I also have this little scar on my wrist, which I've had all of my life, ever since I was a little, little kid. And I always used to look at it and go, I think that's a mark. I feel like it's a mark of something. I just had this feeling about it. Do you believe in past lives? I think I want to ask. Do you think that we come into this world? I am world? a past life specialist. Are you? Okay. Well, let's get into it. Like, yes. Tell us about past lives and what you know about it and maybe some of your experience with this. Number one, my darlings, you really think you're smart enough to get it all done in one life? So not. Of <laughs> course we have past lives. We need them. Um, I was the past life specialist for Robert Schwartz in his books on pre-birth planning and karma. And mm -hmm. why can I do past lives? That's one of the first things. When we get handed our draft notice from spirit, it goes rifling through our file cabinet to see what we got. What do I have? theater major at Brown University, and I acted in New York, so I understand stories and character arcs. Words are my drug of choice. I'm a writer, so I can tell the stories. And I have loved history since I was a wee child in single digits. Put that all together, and my gifts are cards and past lives, because mm -hmm. there could be somebody with me who's good at past lives, just like me, but doesn't have my historical background. You show us both the same vision. She might say, well, it's a long skirt and a big hat with a feather and you're in front of something really fancy. So this has to be old fashioned. I would see the same thing and go, okay, hobble skirt, picture hat, that kind of ostrich feather. You are in front of the Brandenburg gate in Berlin. So this is Berlin in 1911 or 12. Hmm. Which one's going to give you more information? On the other hand, do not ask me to do spirit art because I can't draw a stick figure with a sharp pencil with a lot of prayer. <laughs> not my wheelhouse. Now, why do we have past lives? Because we need to learn things. Karma is not bad and good. It's the kindergarten version, okay? Um, karma is really five things. Unbalanced energy, which is a neutral, healing, service, contrast, and healing of beliefs. Now let's take a look at an incarnation to see how that works. Uh, a lot of people may remember Ryan White. Ryan White was the kid who got AIDS from a blood transfusion yes. in the 80s. And because we didn't know a lot about that then, um, they treated him like a pariah. His family was cruelly handled. But somehow he became friends with Elton John. And Elton John at that point was drinking and drugging and sexing his way to an early grave. Elton loved that child. When Ryan died, he played at Ryan's funeral. Mm -hmm. Ryan inspired him to get clean and sober, which he's been for well over 30 years now, mm. and create the Elton John AIDS Foundation, which has raised over half a billion dollars yep. in for HIV and AIDS research. Now, old line would say, Ryan must have been a terrible person. Look what happened to him. Bad karma. Now we understand that Ryan's higher self, his soul said, all right, in this incarnation, it would be tough and it would be a short one, but look at what I can do for the world. So we say his karma was that of 
service. Mm -hmm. Big difference. When people who are Bible literalists come to me and say, well, the Bible says we only live once I go. And you know what? You're right too. Because what incarnates over and over again is the soul. Crystal, Corby, we are one and done. This particular recipe will never be back down here again. Right. So yes, we do incarnate, but the personality is only down here once. Do you think or feel or know whether reincarnation is compulsory, meaning you got to come back no matter what, or is it free will? Well, it's free will on the part of the soul. Yes. Right. But there are things that we can learn down here that cannot be learned upstairs. You know, um, one of my favorite examples is the white room. You have a white room with white curtains and uh, white furniture and you're in white and the carpet's white and the walls are white. You have no idea of purple. The Eskimos have 200 words for snow and not one for palm trees. They have no idea. Much of what the soul wants to learn and experience has to be down here in the world of duality. But remember also, there is no time there either. Mm -hmm. So your soul doesn't have to come down in one year or two years or 20 or a million. This soul does tend to come down relatively quickly. But I have dealt with uh, people that have crossed over who really don't feel like coming down now. They're busy being spirit guides for people. One person's grandfather who fought in World War II, very well awarded. Um, he spent his time helping those soldiers from the Middle East who died bombing raids, IEDs. And so it's a fast, violent death. And that can sometimes be traumatic for the personality. So the soul comes down as long as it chooses to. But this is not the only lesson plan in the world. We are a less than a dust speck at the arm of one particular galaxy. Who knows what happens if the soul decides to incarnate elsewhere? We try to know, Crystal, but we can't. It's right. like taking an ant into a calculus class. Not only does his little brain not calculate the stuff upstairs, but he can't even hold the pencil in his little paw. Don't All do right. it, do it. And we're the same way. We do what we can, but we'll never understand even a hundredth of it. Right. So my mother passed in 2012. And when she passed, she was a psychic woman. She was also super heart oriented. And she's like, peace out. I am done. All my contracts, mm -hmm. I'm concluding. I'm going. I don't ever want to come back to this prison planet again. I'm, I'm done, done, done. And then she passed and I actually get, I visit with my mother. She's actually active in the work that I do, but my feeling is like, she's coming back. <laughs> I'm like, and I, I'm like, what changed your mind? Like, as soon as we get out of this experience, are we just like, oh, I get it. I see why I would want to be there. Cause sometimes I'm like, I'm, I'm out of here too. The personality is what's done, not the so for instance, you know, the example I use soul versus personality, let's take the actor, Matt Smith. Matt was the 11th doctor in Doctor Who. He was my doctor, the crazy best friend. But when he was done with a bow tie and the two sh short pants, he was Prince Philip for two seasons in The Crown. When he was done with that, then mm -hmm. he was whatever whack job he is in House of the Dragon. Matt Smith is like our soul. Each of the parts he plays is like the incarnation. Now, he may have been really tired of playing the doctor, but that doesn't mean he didn't want to come down again and try Prince Philip. We, we who have finite energy, finite understanding, and botch things while we're down here, because that's part of learning. We may be so tired, we don't want to be here. But anyone who says, oh, I know I'm done, no, you're not. Because <laughs> souls that know they're done, cherish and savor every single moment they have in this last earthly incarnation okay and i think i, I believe i feel that <laughs> i feel that and i okay. think that's what's bearing out for my mom i have to ask you something i wonder if oh, you've I... heard of, heard about this but i have yeah. um it's the reincarnation soul trap this idea that when we die 
we are met with beings masquerading as ancestors. Some people call these the lords of karma. It's very scary. <laughs> and they are enticing us into like a life review, come through the light. But truly, when you go through the light, you're not going to the live life between lives, as Michael Newton has taught us about. You're actually going right back into another incarnation. It's called the reincarnation soul trap. Have you ever heard of this? And do you have an opinion about it? Never heard of it? Never heard of it. And no, that okay. here's why that kind of nasty yeah. is human construct. Correct. Yep. Now, number one, yes, we have to do a life review because otherwise it's like going to college and never taking a test. What I see is the life review is you get to experience every single kind, wonderful thing you ever did. You get to feel what the other person felt. Same thing for the nasty things you did. That's what hell is. But when you're done, you're done. Okay. Then the, the way I described it to my father was, dad, trust me, you're going to get up there. You're going to sign the guest register, unpack your bags and take the orientation tour. And then we'll talk. He looked at me and said, well, honey, I hope that's true. He showed up in my living room three weeks after he died. And when I do medical intuitive work, there's dad, because he was a fabulous cardiologist. <laughs> So you mentioned that your psychic medium abilities kind of came online midway, maybe after you were doing cards, you were doing things, and then you became a psychic medium. Like, how did that happen? One day, were you doing a reading and somebody just walked in, a spirit walked into your office? Um, part of it was when I found out what my most influential past life was. And that was two lives ago when I was a German pilot in World War One. And I found this out because there is a place called the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in upstate New York, and they have World War I repro planes. And mind you, before I had gone there, I was terrified of Germans. All Germans were Nazis. I knew nothing about World War I, literally not nothing. As I watched the planes fly, especially the Fokker Dera one and the Albatross, there was this soundless explosion in my head and my heart, and I thought two things. There's a story behind that, and I flew that one. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, literally overnight, I had to learn to speak German. I would look at books with pilots' pictures, and I wouldn't like this one, and I would know that one, and that was my best friend. Uh, literally overnight, there was no explanation for that, except I started doing past life work and found out who I was. People see the picture of that guy now and me at roughly the same age. And they say, oh my God, was that your grandfather? You look so much like him. So when you start doing that work, that's when you move forward into connecting upstairs. And I found that I had become a doorway, especially for soldiers. And I remember the first time I had to do that. Well, I'll back up. About a year after that revelation, I was in Verdun on a tour of the Western Front and staying at um, a, a B and B type, but it was in some old castle, mansion, whatever. And it was like all the dead guys knew that the party line phone was open, and there were shadows in the room and whispers all night, and I did not sleep. Hmm. Um, when I got home. One night in my living room, there was a little German, German trench soldier from World War I. I only saw this much of his face. The rest of it apparently had been blown away. First thing they always ask is who won. And you have to explain to them it doesn't matter anymore. It's been you know, now over a century. Um, you help them forgive the person who killed them. You help them forgive themselves for those they killed. And then you can get them into the light. Those are fragments of the soul that are caught in the gray spaces, usually from a very violent death. That's when I realized, yep, I could talk to dead people. Um, I don't go fishing, though. You know, I see a woman in a flower dress handing you a rose. It's grandma. Oh, please. Right. That's so vague. I use what I call dog tags. I will ask you for the name of the person you want, who they were to you, when they died, and how old they were. Example, Jerome Richard Dorkin, my father, who died in 2001 at the age of 80. That tells me nothing gets me right into the energy. And for some reason, my guides like to play charades. Uh, my fingers will go to my mouth for smoking. Palm will hit my head for it was an accident. 
my hand will cover my mouth if they were intubated on oxygen and having trouble mm -hmm. breathing. I didn't learn this anywhere. This is just what my guides want to do. And that way we get very specific stuff on your dead Aunt Mabel. And as soon as we both agree, yep, that's her. I open the door and I will tell you exactly what she's saying. I will not censor, which is why I will never do a gallery with mediumship. Because I don't censor, it's intensely personal. Mm -hmm. You may not want 200 strangers hearing what's coming out of my mouth. Yeah. So when you saw that soldier there and he's in the gray spaces, as you say, do you, did you have an intuition to help cross him? Is there anything, do you, do you do that in part of your work in ministry? Do you help people? If they show up, if they show up. Remember, I was just learning about my own life in World sure. War One. Yeah. Um, you know, I died over Zonnebeck Ridge in 17 being shot down. So you see that soldier and you viscerally know from your life what he went through and you just reach out to him. Okay. Um, let me just change lanes a little bit because I want to yep. kind of go back to this idea of reincarnation and mm -hmm. the concept of a walk-in. Do you know what a walk-in is? Can you explain? To I you? sure do. Okay. What is I a walk-in? Sure All right. No, it is not invasion of the body snatchers, guys. <laughs> but your soul and another soul would have a conference. Your soul is really kind of ready to check out. But this other soul says, look, I left a lot of work unfinished. It'll only take me a little while. I don't have to go through childhood. Are you willing to exchange? And your soul will say yes or no. It's why people who have heart transplants, lung transplants, people who die on the table kind of thing, they may come out with a totally different personality. They're not being haunted. Um, a dear friend of mine, she has passed. She had a heart lung transplant and the patient was that gave her those gifts was an 18 year old Hispanic who is a nice Jewish lady from Boston. All of a sudden, after she recovered, she had a taste for beer she had a taste for hot food. And before that, she was Marlon Blando, couldn't stand anything spicy. And her, she, the whole thing was, there was a, almost a Hispanic aura about her. Not that she was planning because she did not know who her donor was until about two years later. So it wasn't subliminal. So is that the organ though? Like the- Yes. The, and, and or is it like Heart an lung. actual soul swap in that situation? In that situation, mm -hmm. that was just the organ. Right. But what I'm saying is that's the kind of personality differentiation that can happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone, there have been some real difficult ones when there's a, walk in on on the table and all of a sudden someone you've been married to for 20 years doesn't recognize you doesn't feel the love you have and is polite and, and etc but it feels like a total stranger to you hmm. so walk-ins are really very very rare okay um it's not you can't use it as an excuse well i know that i'm changing so i must be a walk-in no no you will know literally DNA deep that you are not the person that you used to be. Okay. Interesting. With regard to reincarnation again, do you think that we as a soul, our oversoul, I guess you could say, yeah. has dispatched multiple versions of us across the galaxy, across the multiverses? Are we having many, many, many different incarnations? And if we are, can we communicate with our other me's? Like, is there a link or thread? You can line? when they're dead. Because, okay. um, for instance, I have communicated with the part of my soul that was the German pilot, as if I'm talking to a totally separate person, even though there are little bits of him in me that repeat. Uh, but for instance, he could play the violin. He was an engineer. Um, I can play Spotify. <laughs> and <laughs> one and one is three on alternate Tuesdays. Don't ask me to build anything. <laughs> uh, he was a brilliant pilot. I get vertigo. So sometimes 
the oversoul makes sure we don't want you to repeat things. So we're doing a different recipe here. Um, there can be double drops. For instance, when I was doing my work early, I ascertained that the soul was also dropped down in a personality in New Zealand, a sheep farmer with five sons and a mild alcohol problem. Don't know if this person is alive or dead. We'll never meet them because that's like touching a couple of electrical wires that shouldn't match, okay? Or if you remember Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort when their um, wands matched, boom, because they both had the same core, Phoenix Feather, I think. So it would be interesting to meet them, but if they are still alive and incarnate at this time, no, you won't. Okay, interesting. I have a question that's totally a left field. I hope that's okay. <laughs> you seem what like you have for a living? you seem You're like you kidding. have a wealth of knowledge. Do you believe in curses? And if someone is cursed, how might they know that they are? And how do you remove a curse? Since I mean I went to that psychic and she said I had to remove all these curses. Like are curses real? They are, but not quite the way people see them. Now, one of the things about um, a true professional intuitive is they will know when something is not in their wheelhouse. I don't deal with curses myself. There are two people that I know who do. One of them is Katrina Rasbold. She's out in California. She has published several books for Llewellyn. Uh, she is a bruja. She understands it. The other is my friend Tiffany Butler who is a shaman here in the Capital District area of New York. And as a matter of fact, I was feeling for some reason depressed and really losing myself when I would come home. I'd be fine on the road. I'd come home but and it wasn't that I was having a problem with my husband because I didn't. Uh, Tiff came in and cleared windows, cleared mirrors, placed crystals, and I did not expect any big ta-da over this. But within 36 hours, it was as if I had scrubbed out my brain and polished it. Hmm. So are there curses? Yes. Are they the way they are in snuff films? I highly doubt it. But if you've got something like that, you go to a shaman, you go to a bruja, you find out their reputation first. Because neither Katrina nor Tiffany will get you coming back constantly. Mm -hmm. They want, if they can do it, one and done. Or they'll say, this is the kind of thing that if you don't watch your own boundaries, we'll have to repeat. But they teach you how to keep yourself well boundaried. That's the difference between a Madam Hoo-ha and a true professional. <laughs> Um, you're delightful. Okay. So did you, so Tiffany came in incidentally, or did you know that something was wrong and that there might've been some wonky energy? I, Tiff on is you? a friend of mine. She's also a great medical massage therapist. I got her okay. on my back. Um, and I said, Tiff, can you check the house, please? This mm -hmm. doesn't feel right. And she came in with her kit and blew him out of the water. So yes, she was invited into the house. She didn't say, oh, you're cursed. It's right. like a doctor doesn't walk up to you at a cocktail party and say, oh, you know, I think that you may have a gallbladder problem and, you know, lift your skirt. Wrong venue. And he wasn't asked. But Tiff was invited. She was hired, mm -hmm. came in, dealt with it. And it's been clear since. Have you ever been spiritually attacked? I mean, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, by a, a spirit or mm -hmm. by another human being. Psychic. No, this okay, was a okay. spirit spirit. Okay. Uh, this was when I was first doing this work, starting in the early 90s, and first finding out about my World War I life. I was working with a woman who was out in Colorado at the time. And one of the things that we had seen was all of a sudden we saw somebody, short, stout gentleman in World War II aviation officer's uniform from Germany. We determined that it was Ernst Udet, who had also flown in World War I. He had committed suicide. 
So we work to pull that soul out of the gray spaces. And we saw him writing in lipstick, Iron Man, why have you forsaken me? Now, Iron Man was the nickname of Hermann Goering, who had been friends. They had also flown to World War I, but of course was Hitler's number two. That night, after we had done what we had to do for Ernst, both the other person and me, we had nightmares about the Reichstag. We saw uh, Udet's picture slammed off a wall. We both had the same nightmares and we felt stuff in the mm -hmm. house. When we were driving me to the airport, all of a sudden in front of us drives a car with a license plate, Iron Man 5. Okay, so we're here in this and I get back to Atlanta and I'm in my living room. And all of a sudden my big Maine Coon who was afraid of nothing does the Halloween thing, runs upstairs and I'm in a, you know, a big shirt, flannel shirt. All of a sudden the tail goes and stands up right in front of my face, I feel hands around my neck and he says, do you still believe I can't get in? Well, I fought him down. I talked to my friend and I called my friend, Adam. I love Adam. Adam has a big neon sign on the astral that says, I'm a professional, I don't care. And this was in the nineties when the, the airline stuff was much easier, but he did manage to get a six foot ceremonial sword through the metal detector and they thought it was golf clubs. <laughs> so he came to the house in Atlanta we put that puppy in a bottle. He's never bothered me since. I have my wards. I have my protection. But yes, um, nasty things can get you, which is why, for instance, <clears throat> I tell people, don't mess with Ouija boards. Okay. When you play with a Ouija board and you don't know how to ground center and shield, that is like throwing open your door in a strange neighborhood and yelling free beer. You do not know who's out there, but they heard you when you're coming. And yes, Jane Roberts got Seth and Esther Hicks got Abraham and Pat Rodegast got Emmanuel through a Ouija board. But I have had to handle two hysterical, terrified teenagers who the first time they put their hands on a planchet and said, who's there? Spelled very fast backwards was, I have an accent, I'm here to kill you. Trust me, it wasn't their uncle Danny. Mm -hmm. And for everybody who says it's in the toy department, how dangerous can it be? And this always comes up when I lecture. I'll say, okay, who here in the audience has a kid or a grandkid under 10? And hands go up. I say, you, how old? Eight. What's the kid's name? Joshy. Fine. Joshy comes and says, Grandma, Grandma, I got all these on my report card. You said I could have a toy. Let's go. And he drags you to the toy department and points to a box that says, my first chainsaw. It's in the toy department. Going to let him play with it by himself? I don't think so. Get right. real. Well, this is interesting because back in the heyday of spiritualism, Sir Arthur mm -hmm. Conan Doyle, who is a renowned yeah. spiritualist and author of mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes, etc., mm -hmm. um, declared that the Ouija board or the, or the talking board was like one of the most important innovations in science and spirituality. Like you really believed mm -hmm. in it. Everybody back then did. But something mm -hmm. happened over the century, like over the next hundred years with the Ouija board. I'm wondering if it's the board itself, which is really, you know, like a card. It's just made of wood. It's got a planchette. It's just natural materials. But it's almost like there's a stigma or an attachment that has been placed upon the board. So now you are more likely when you get one to experience whatever it's attached to. It's thought forms. Yep. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Everybody thinks of Santa Claus as benevolent and kind and generous. And so that is the energy that attaches to that thought form. When people were using the Ouija board and understood you set the tone and you treat it respectfully and you ask for guidance and protection, then it behaved. Once it became a toy, that's when you know the, the lower entities at the corner of Akashic and Karma would look at people playing with it who didn't know anything and go, hey, Sid, there's another one, let's go mess. Mm -hmm. To the point where that's why it's scared. Look at tarot cards. Tarot cards are merely a tool, but people saw them in snuff movies and B movies and, and horrible things for years. So there are some people to this day who say, I don't want you to use their, their tarot cards, they're evil, but tell me what you see psychically. Right. So that's what it is. It's gotten a rep mm -hmm. because people were careless using it. Right. I think that's right. I think, and it's, it's important to differentiate because it is just a tool and the tool mm -hmm. serves you, 
you don't serve the tool but i it is like a big flare that goes up in the astral and attracts all these um malicious mischievous earthbounds who want to come and just mess around with you and it's it's you got to be very careful and the energy you take into any tool divination tool is pretty much the energy you're going to get out of it so if you're just a, a bunch mm-hmm. of teenagers in a cemetery drinking and super scared at midnight with your ouija board well guess what you're going to have a pretty terrible experience probably mm-hmm. yeah you're going to repeat michael jackson in, in thriller you really don't <laughs> want to do that you don't want to do that talk, let's talk about i know i'm i know we, we should wrap up soon because but i just could talk i think i could talk to you all day what do you think about demons are they real or are they people they have, to be. Um, they have to be real i have not had experience with demons though i know practitioners i respect who have so all i can say is yes i do believe that they exist i am very fortunate in that my crew upstairs keeps them way off my 40 acres here Interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I grew up in fundamentalist Christianity before I got the heck out of it. And um, mm-hmm. so demons, 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 that was part of the whole construct of the Pentecostal church. Mm-hmm. And when I left, I said, oh, gosh, that's just fiction, you know, certainly not. And I don't believe that one third of the angels in heaven fell. And I'm not going to believe in that anymore. But there's a difference, I think, in terms of energy between, I mean, that's out there and anything there's always a duality. So if there is the light, the source, there's going to be the opposite end of that spectrum, that other polarity, yes. that pull. And negative spirits. Are. Yes. But, you know, actual BLs above. No, 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 no. That's mythology. Wouldn't you say? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, so let me ask you, if someone were to come to you um, for a psychic reading, what kind of psychic reading would they get? And what's your ideal kind of client? Somebody who's looking to shift their life, they want to find about, out about their marriage, somebody who wants to call in their spirit guides, like, what do you do? And what kind of clients do you attract typically? Um, well, because of my attitude, and I am a charismatic, I admit it, you either love me or you hate me. Um, the people who truly come to me are the ones who really want to learn. Yeah. who are open to information. When, but I don't say, well, this is what you need. Because when you sit down, first thing I'm going to say is, what is the most important thing you want to get out of your knowing? Because even if you're, I'm fast. And even if you're with me for half an hour or an hour, I'm not going to look at your entire life. So if I go from your life encyclopedia A to S, and you want it down here at V, you'll leave and say, ah, she didn't tell me anything. So you'll tell me what you're interested in. It usually comes down to four things. The everyday tour bus, house, car, job, kids. Okay, got you, put me here, what the hell? Who was I in 1642, Belgium? I wanna to speak to my spirit guide, Banky, or dead Aunt Mabel. It's what people come to me for. When they say, I'm not sure, I will go very Brooklyn on them and go, okay, darling, let's fight in your bet. Because you say that, everybody's got one. Mm-hmm. And then that opens the door and we go wherever we want to go. But I don't say you can only use these tools. A doctor does not say, you made an appointment with me and I'm sorry if you want uh, an x-ray, I'm only going to give you a needle today. A doctor does what you need. And I am the same way. Um, There are certain things that I won't do. Do not ask me for sweepstakes number. I mean, me first. And if your psychic isn't driving a Lexus, how do you know they know? Do not keep beating on me because you want the right answer. This right. is typical. Mm-hmm. Does Bruce love me? No. Well, is he going to love me? Not the way you'd like. Well, if I do such and such, is he going right. to love me? No, he's not. Right. And, you know, and it goes on like this and they beat on you because they're hoping you'll finally go. Yes. Yes. He loves you and he wants seven babies with you, but he just doesn't know it yet. Oh, good. I thought so. <laughs> Don't do that. I mean, look, Crystal, I admit I have done stand up comedy. I bet you think a psychic's life is easy because I take my work very seriously, but me not so much. And frankly, when you get people laughing, their shields drop and the information gets in a lot faster. Yeah. Well, if somebody, how booked out are you since you are seeing so many people? Well, it depends on what kind of a reading because I have something like two dozen different kinds. I've got a five minute burning question to a soul plane reading, which is like the work I did with Robert Schwartz. They are booking out into April because they're exhausting. You give me the homework that I send out to you. And then I'm in my chair at 630 in the morning, deep trance meditation for basically 12 hours, pulling down multiple past lives and talking to your higher self. And then you're on the phone with me for an hour. The next day, I'm a crispy critter. So 
two a month is all I'll do with those. But mm -hmm. you just want a general reading, you could probably get me in two days because okay. I work six days a week, 14 hours a day. There's lots of room and time. So how would somebody book with you? Where did they go? Oh, they can't avoid me, Crystal. <laughs> CorbyMitlai.com is the website. It's got how to book with me. It's got well over 100 articles. And it's got the testimonials you want to look at. You can also find me YouTube, Medium, Pinterest, Instagram. And if you want to work with me on a regular basis, learning stuff, uh, then you would go to my Patreon page where I have what I call the nest. And every month it's me. And so far it's about 16 people. And we do all kinds of stuff, cards, past lives, crystals. I will bring in other teachers uh, on subjects I don't know. And it is truly tribe so that you have people you can know, you can trust. And it's not all about me. It's about us. So that's how you find me. All right. Links to all of that in the description of this video and also in the description of this podcast. And again, your books are Clean Out Your Life Closet, The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, and you've got the magic. Who needs a genie? One last question before we yes. go. Um, mm -hmm. and, and anytime I get an intuitive or a psychic, I like to ask this question. Um, what do you see for 2023 and beyond? <laughs> One thing, you don't have to say like all the things, but like, isn't anything we need to know? What you need to know is, I'll be honest with you, I have a lot of friends who are psychics and astrologers and all of them are looking at me wide-eyed saying, it's so convoluted, everything is on a knife edge, we can't tell. This is probably one of the toughest prediction years I have ever seen. So what I'm gonna tell people is know who you love, keep your pandemic pantry full and put on your seatbelts, kid, because as Margot Channing said in All About Eve, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Okay. We'll leave it right there. I think we all feel that, you know, and I just, mm -hmm. I think that, and we've had many intuitives that have affirmed that. Well, Corby, this has been such a great conversation. I mean, we could have, we could have gone in so many other directions if we had the time. Maybe we'll have you back in some time in the future and we can really drill down into a topic or two. But you're I fascinating. And I, I really recommend um, if you're interested in getting a reading. I mean, I'm interested. So I'm going to be going to your site. I'm going to be looking at it. <laughs> but if you're interested, links in the description. Check her out. And again, thank you so much for joining us on the Life Magnetic Podcast. <laughs>